MTBK gives executives and owners of mid-market businesses unparalleled confidence and clarity so you can focus on strategic objectives and organizational success. Their multidisciplinary advisors, accountants, and team members have a wealth of experience and are all available and responsive to each client to ensure the most effective advice, actions, and outcomes no matter the situation or complexity level. That experience base and one team approach combined with integrated and efficient way of operating enable them to be truly proactive partners doing the best thing for their client every time. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK can work for you. Hi, this is Josh Reed, Sports Director at WIVB Channel 4 in Buffalo, and you are listening to the Tim Graham and Friends Podcast. What are you doing? Uh, Tim's been bothering me to do this thing for his podcast. Oh, sorry. Still, I gotta stop this, I guess. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic. You can see that Jonah Bronstein's not joining us on this one, but that's okay because we have a true heavyweight to uh, pick up the slack. Bill Barnwell of ESPN is joining us, but just so people know, uh, Jonah was called to duty. Uh, Joey Votto making his Buffalo Bisons debut on his his attempt to return to the major leagues with the Toronto Blue Jays, the probably a future Hall of Famer, Joey Votto, I would say. And uh, Bill Barnwell and I, we go back quite a ways. But Bill, we when I was at ESPN, you were just getting started at ESPN. I was there for only three years. But your ESPN bio says you joined, they count Grantland mm -hmm. in 2011 which was my last year at ESPN. That doesn't sound right to me. Were you doing work for ESPN before you joined Grantland? I Did, was. Or am I not remembering it right? No, no, you got it correct. Okay. I was at Football Outsiders before Grantland. And I, as someone who I'm very good about nagging people to get stuff done, would nag you with stuff. Hey, Tim, do you want to talk about this in, in your blog? It's Football Outsiders that. And so uh, I did that for several years. And I did some stuff for Insider. Back then, I was writing for ESPN Insider um, back in the day through Football Outsiders, which is an incredibly just bizarre thing to explain to say that you were an outsider and an insider simultaneously. Um, but of course, uh, going back to the AFC East days, um, and then I started at Grantland in 2011, but you would have known me years before that. I would yeah, I, that's I what I thought. I remember coming to you with like, Hey, I got this idea. How do I flesh this out? You're the football, you know, you're, you could understand the numbers so much better than I could. And you helped me out quite a bit. Well, I'm happy. I helped. That's why that, that leads me to be here all these years later. I, I, you know, it was such a weird time, right? Because like now I feel almost spoiled. There's so much data out there. There's so much in terms of video, in terms of film. None of this stuff was around in 2007, 2008, 2009. Even until like 2015, a lot of the stuff was unavailable. So I, it was like, if I had a good stat, I was like, oh my God, every single Bills writer, every single AFC writer is going to want this or use this because it's like a precious thing that just popped up in the wild, like a, a number um whereas now it just feels like there's numbers everywhere yeah that i was searching high and low for things i <laughs> we back then at uh, espn.com i don't think they follow the same method now with their coverage of the nfl from the the writers but when i was there they had a feed the beast mentality and i was writing from the moment i crawled out of bed in the morning until i you know when i went to bed is when i shut my laptop down for the day and it was not a healthy way to live but yeah every little thing was potential content for me to feed the beast. Um, let me give a more formal introduction okay. of Bill Barnwell here. Of course, you know him from Football Outsiders. Before that, he was, or no, after that, a founding member at Grantland, which you mentioned, and was there throughout the entire duration of Grantland, been with ESPN full-time since 2011. Uh, but you see him a lot on Scott Van Pelt. He has his own podcast, The Bill Barnwell Show. You read his work as a senior writer at ESPN.com. And we're going to get into his thoughts about the Buffalo Bills. Mm -hmm. But you mention the proliferation of numbers, data analysis, 
Bill James just a couple of weeks ago had an interesting uh, tweet that I think sparked a lot of conversation regarding getting maybe too far into the weeds. Maybe we're <laughs> have we have we gotten too nuanced or too granular with statistical measurements that aren't as significant as they used to be because we keep trying to advance and advance and refine. And, uh, and have we, have we gone too far? <laughs> yeah, it's a legit question, especially in baseball. I feel like where they're so far ahead of where we are in football, but I said the difference is baseball, obviously there there's more, how can I put this? The, 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 the matchups are, easier separated right like there's the pitcher batter matchup every pitch is its own sort of in innate thing own discrete thing whereas in football obviously things are much more fluid things are much more um much much more difficult to separate right in terms of individual players and their impact on the player next to them uh you know it, it's harder to separate that stuff out and obviously places try to do so pro football focus does it with their model other other websites try to do it in terms of you know separating out player value and things like that the the thing i would say is we have access to a ton more information now than we did, especially I mean, 30 years ago when Bill James was writing his book or got 40 years ago at this point now. Um, that That's different. And, and I think making sense of that is going to be tougher because with Bill James, and the thing I like about Bill James's work, especially back when he was writing books, is everything had a question to it. Like, like things started with a question as opposed to, the data and trying to get questions from the data. And I think that's the right process to go through when you're covering a sport, when you're trying to find information about a sport. Everyone's human. Everyone's going to, if you find a cool thing in the data, you're going to eventually, you know, put it out there, even if it's not formulated by a question to begin with. I, I think the difference between football and other sports is, and, and football maybe now versus football 15 years ago, is yes, there's a ton more data and teams are much more open to gathering that data. I mean, when I started, maybe three teams had an analytics person. Now teams have full analytics departments. Every single NFL team, to my knowledge, has multiple people who, if you ask them what their primary role is, they would say analytics. But the difference now with the NFL, I think, is the, you know, the desire and the rigor with which that data is implemented into your day-to-day -day processes. And I think that's different from baseball in that with baseball, 29 teams maybe, maybe every team is using analytics as part of their process. You cannot avoid it. In the NFL, that's tougher. I, I think there's probably a few teams that use it a lot. And maybe they have that question about, that they have to ask that question that, that Bill James is asking, whether they're using it too much. I think there's probably a handful of teams who don't really use it at all, where they the people don't have access to the decision makers, they get left out of the room. And then everyone else is kind of in between. And I think for the in-between people, they're probably not at where Bill James is saying, but th th there's that question of how much you're using data to challenge your beliefs. I think that's the big thing. Um, if you're only using data to kind of confirm what you believe already, then it's not helpful. It's just confirmation bias. If you're throwing out the stuff that you don't believe, then that's not helpful. But if you're using, if you're just taking what you don't believe at face value, then yes, that is doing what Phil James is saying. If you're using that to challenge your beliefs, but then to question it further, to use data more, to try to combine it with film, to combine it with what you know about the NFL as a whole, I think that's where the most progress is gained. So I think you you want to get close to where you feel like you're using it too much, but not use it too much if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. And Bill, I think that it still holds true that your analytics department is only as strong as the people listening to it. Absolutely. And like you say, you use the phrase getting laughed out of the room. Um, and sometimes people just roll their eyes or they don't understand it. And if they don't understand it right away, they don't have time to try. You know, it's yeah. a you know time crunch or whatever it is with football coaches and their cot behind their desk and that whole thing. And trying to crunch yeah. more. I'll, I'll crunch more film before I try to figure out what these numbers <laughs> mean or a general manager or an owner. I mean, it doesn't matter. Wh whoever it is that's supposed to be implementing this information, you're only as strong as that. Now that said, I'm sure departments are stronger than others. But when you talk to people in the analytics community, what do you find is that reception level? Or, and, I'm, and how has that changed over time or maybe even just in recent mm -hmm. years to go from uh, to breaking down that um, 
uh, you know, that wall of, of <laughs> resistance, uh, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. It, it almost is literally breaking down a wall at some points. It feels like, uh, it really depends from team to team, but I, I would say on the whole, you know, 15 years ago, I, I think laughed out of the room would not be an exaggeration. Like, uh, you might bring something to a GM or a coach or even an owner, and they would say, this can't help me. Why, why would you like, who are, we, who are you? Why do you work for us? Not crazy to hear that stuff said in terms of people retelling stories about them working with coaches and GMs, whether it's because they realize that it's not smart for them to do that, whether it's because they actually have made a change in what they believe, you don't hear that anymore. You know, people are typically, they have access to coaches. They have access to GMs. They don't have maybe as much access as they would like or what they would need to actually change things from organization to organization, but you're not you're not kept out of the room. Um, something that, that I would say was the case maybe 15 years ago, I think less so now, would be scouting reports, for example. You know, if you were an analytics person and you were building uh, a, a data set on college college prospects, which is obviously really valuable if you can find some meaningful data, a good number of teams would not even give you their own scouting reports on players, which is crazy because you're working for the same team. You would think, okay, that's a pretty basic piece of information to share, but they were so hesitant to give access to people that that was not the case. That That's no longer, to my knowledge, really the case. Maybe there's a team or two who does that, but every team now, you know, they're comfortable sharing information with their employees on the analytics side. And I think the other thing that's happened is you have more people who can speak both elements of the game in a thoughtful manner. I mean, there are teams who have hired the nerdiest nerds who have ever nerded. Um, and that's nothing wrong with that if you are willing to listen to them. But a lot of teams are comfortable, you know, hiring someone who played football in college, who has a math background or has a programming or development background where you have some level of innate football knowledge of having played. Um, people who have worked in other sports where they have a basis of dealing with, you know, uh, coaches or GMs on the baseball side or basketball side, where you have the experience of working in an organization. I think there's a, you know, but both, both sides have had to come meet the other in the middle. I think um, on the executive side, the traditional executive side, I think they've had to recognize, hey, these people are valuable. They can help things. They can help us. Um, we've seen it work for other franchises. And I think we've seen the nerd side also, you know, learn a little more about football. Um, the conversations people have and, and the people who are having those conversations have a lot more basis in football than maybe they did uh, 15, 20 years ago. I actually didn't expect to get so deep into this, but my curiosity, <laughs> it's my podcast. I can ask, yeah. sorry to listeners out there who want to hear Bill talk about his offensive playmaker uh, rankings, but I have one more question <laughs> about analytics. What do you, I mean, from going to the Sloan conference or talking to people, I'm sure that you are, you know, you're kind of immersed in this um, industry, the evolution of schools, that are teaching sports analy analytics, uh, Syracuse being maybe the biggest, I don't know, maybe you know of a, a one that's bigger, but I mean, I know that I've helped kids out from that program before with, you know, papers and things. I've been interviewed for it, you know, help them maybe, you know, locate a job or get them into, you know, into uh, contact with some, the right person at pro football focus or what have you. Um, are there enough jobs to go around for the people who are studying this? I mean, it's, is there a cap on this? There is a cap on it. I will say that I think every team could stand to stand to add six analytic people, six analytics person, six analytic persons. I'm a good writer. I know, I know what plural You're right, good. plurals are. Six analytic six peoples, analytics peoples, six analytic persons. Um, How about just six sports analysts or data? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that, 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 that's the editor coming out in you. I appreciate that. Six, <laughs> six Sports analytics associates, uh, and without batting an eye. I mean, these are teams who have millions of dollars to work with in terms of their budget. You know, um, a, a team wouldn't bat an eye at paying a million dollars for a third string quarterback who's never going to see the field. Like, you know, if they wanted to pay for a bunch of uh, analytic support, they could with no problems. Um, the 37th assistant coach. Yeah. You know, exactly. They don't have any problem adding that 12th guy yeah. to the strength and conditioning staff. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I think that, that's not stuff that's capped. If your owner is willing to support that, go for it. 
But what I would say is, I don't believe we're close to that because of the competition. And this is what makes hiring the right analytics people and keeping them around tough. Sports doesn't pay very well. You know, when I hear people talk about how uh, there are certain critics who will say, oh, analytics nerds only want to get in sports. This is their way in. Like they're, they're, there's no, they have to convince people that they're valuable and they're not valuable. I always think about who, you know, except all directors are this, who they're competing with. Like if, if the Raiders want to hire an analytics person, they're not competing with the Browns. They're competing with Google. They're competing with Apple. They're competing with tech companies, all of whom are going to pay significantly more than a, a sports team would for those same skills, for the development skills, for the programming skills, for the math skills. There's so many, like any, any company that's putting out an AI product is paying more than for a college graduate who has that background than an NFL team would. And that's true in other sports too, in baseball, basketball, hockey, soccer, same thing. Um, you're, you're still making a decent living. Like you're not, it's not like you're getting paid like, like the Ravens, uh, you know, uh, entry level people are getting what they're getting. The story was thirty twenty eight thousand dollars a year, I think, back in the day, um, to ferry people around. You're getting paid meaningful money, but if if your goal is to make money, you're going to work somewhere else. And a lot of people do work for a year or two or three years in sports, and then they go to work in for a different industry with that skill set. Maybe they, you know, maybe they go work in in tech. Maybe they go work in finance. Lots of places you can go with those skills, and so. I think, I think that holds true of, for sports jobs, period, whether it's yeah. journalism or whatever. They weed, you're weeded out by how bad you want to do it. And yeah, if and, you don't want yeah. to do it, then you go find a way to make easier money doing the same job, like you say. Yeah. And I think you have to be really passionate about it. Certainly, if you get to a high level, if you're, you know, um, crazy Adolfo Mensa, if you're Andrew Berry, those guys are obviously super, super smart. Um, they become GMs, they make really good money, and they should, they deserve it. But you know, that's a rare outcome. That is not the, that is the 99th percentile outcome for someone who gets hired to do analytics coming out of school for 18. So I think that that sort of caps it innately without having to worry about, are there too many jobs? Because there's just that reality of people are going to go work elsewhere because there's going to be financial opportunities elsewhere that are more meaningful. I'm channeling Bill's fans here. This isn't me really asking the question, <laughs> but where do you get off Ranking the Bills offensive playmakers 24th in the league, sir. Dropping them from 20, yeah. 20 to 24. Okay, I understand a drop. You know, Gabe Davis <laughs> and Diggs are gone. I get it, man. But 24? Yeah. Your thoughts? I mean, I mean, are you excited about the Bills playmakers right now, Tim's fans? Um, no. Well, no. But I happen to think... <laughs> But I happen to think that Josh Allen alone would would drive you up. Now, is the quarterback okay. not involved at all in these the rankings? Quarterback is not involved. This is. I know different. it's your top. I know you mentioned it's the well, top five guys, but still, doesn't think it should. I guess in, in your rankings, it would be in. Uh, you can take any quarterback. Uh, yep. You know, average quarterback, average and quarterback, this is what's going to happen. Average scheme, average offensive line, average play caller, average kicker. Who would have the best offense in football? But doesn't, and again, this is a philosophical discussion. I, I, you don't do these things without putting in a great deal of thought, not only in the rankings, but the process and the methodology that, of how you're going to do it. That That's the sad part, to be honest with you, Tim, is that I get feedback like, you you spent two seconds doing this. And it's like, you may think it's wrong. <laughs> right. You can, would not believe how much time I put into doing the dumbest possible ideas. I will say you that from personal ideas, experience. All the I put into it. Yeah, from personal experience, me giving you a dumb idea. <laughs> and uh, and and you would say, I'll get back to you. And it would take three days because you you, <laughs> you did you did the work. Um, but isn't there something to a really good quarterback bringing out things in a in a in a playmaker that maybe you wouldn't have on a with a lesser quarterback? Of course. And certainly, you know, think about Josh Allen. For every running back the Bills have, he changes the numbers for them in the run game. Right. Because. If you're a defensive coordinator, you can't play with the same numbers in the box because you have to account for Josh Allen. He adds one to your your run count. And so that means maybe you put a, a player in the box. Maybe you bring up a safety into the box. 
That is one of the classic ways to address that. Well, now you're good in the box, but you have one deep safety. You can't play too deep, which everyone wants to play in the NFL now. So now you're facing single high coverage. Now you have more passing opportunities. And that balance of how the quarterback changes that makes everyone's life easier. It creates more space for every receiver. It creates more space for the running back because now linebackers can't flow to outside runs as quickly. The backside defensive end who might chase down the cutback on outside zone. Well, he has to stay put because you don't know if Josh Allen's going to keep the ball on, on, you know, and, and run straight forward. Like they're, a quarterback, quarterbacks affect everyone in different ways, right? Like Patrick Mahomes makes life easier for his receivers in different ways. I do think that it's impossible to totally separate it but I, I, that's what I was trying to do at the very least. And I think, you know, when you look at what the Bills have done the past couple of years, it, certainly it feels like Josh Allen has been the one getting more out of his receivers, his running backs and his tight ends than the other way around. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, Stefan Diggs would disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> sure. He uh, he and his brother pretty much uh uh, commented on that there his way out of the out of the organization uh, mm -hmm. that he made josh more than vice versa mm -hmm. which brandon bean had a nice comment uh, <laughs> uh based on the trade he said what i don't know how many pro bowls he had before he got here but i think he had what three <laughs> you know he's kind of like yeah. hey, i think we know how many pro bowls uh, uh you you know brandon exactly how many pro bowls um when you were deciding which receiver look, let me so James Cook, obviously the Pro yeah, Bowl running back, you're yeah. going to use him. Dalton Kincaid, for my, in my opinion, probably the only other than Josh Allen, the only safe Bills player to draft for your fantasy league. Yes, um, because you don't know what's going to happen, even with James Cook, mm -hmm. uh, with Ray Davis uh, on the team. Mm -hmm. um, how did you decide the other three? Because it is such a menagerie. Uh, of, of pieces. <laughs> Curtis Samuel, I guess, is an is an obvious one. But how'd you, how'd you go about picking the five bills? Yeah, you know, I I, I sort of when I go through it, I, I'm I'm not just considering five players. Like I'm really going through everyone, and then saying, okay, who are the five most likely players to make an impact? And running back and tight end, obviously, Cook and Kincaid are accounted for. And then it's okay. Well, what what does the team's investment tell me about these different players? Right, Curtis Samuel signed in free agency. Um, not not too huge money, but signed early in free agency, clearly a priority for Brandon Bean and company. So, okay, well, he's one of the guys. Keon Coleman, taken high in the second round, a player of the Bills. You know, they traded down, so they weren't desperate to prioritize a wide receiver. It wasn't that they saw him as a once-in-a-generation talent, but history tells me with this kind of depth chart, a, a player taken high in the second round is typically going to play a lot. So he's in the mix. And then it's, well, then it's kind of a mix. Shakir played a bunch last year. He was efficient, but is he clearly was not a player they saw as like a, a guaranteed every every week starter, even though he has, you know, still a fair amount of upside given his speed. Um, you have guys like Claypool and Valdez Scantling and Matt Collins, where they bounced around the league. Clearly they have some value, um, especially Valdez Scantling, who, you know, did win two Super Bowls the past couple of years. Um, but, you know, history tells us we know enough about those guys. They're, you know, could always be surprised, but they're not likely to be significantly impactful i think if you're making the case for the bills being higher you'd argue that the fact that they have decent depth at receiver that they have four five six guys who they could call on on a week-to-week -week basis depending you could on probably have gone with seven of these guys because yeah. the difference between the, the fourth the third guy and the seventh guy probably isn't that much right so to me that was always a tiebreaker i think i probably put the bills up a spot or two because i said okay even if they don't have a star wide receiver at least they have enough pieces that they're not going to be stuck playing some guy nobody's ever heard of in week 13 because of they have that talent, that, that depth one through five, and, and aren't the guys who are going to be inactive probably if they make the roster. So that that helps. But, I mean, you look at the bottom of this list, the Bills are ahead of a team like the Commanders, where the Commanders have Terry McLaren, who to me is a top 15 NFL wide receiver. Like the Bills have more depth. They have better running backs. They have better tight ends. That makes up for the difference. That's why they're ahead of a team like the Commanders. But it's rare for a team, especially a competitive team in the NFL, to not have a wide receiver better or who projects better than Curtis Samuel. Um, you know, the Chiefs did it, and I think that's kind of what the Bills are trying to emulate in some ways, but that was a – they also had a Hall of Fame tight end who kind of made that process a little bit easier. Right. And the 49ers were your uh, number one team, which yes. – 
explains how somebody like Brock Purdy can get to the Super Bowl. <laughs> and that's, again, I would say to Bills fans upset about being ranked 24th, that's how good Josh Allen is. I mean, that's that's how otherworldly this guy is, is that they can maybe have a uh, uh, that in, that in an objective analysis, there's some, there's obviously subjectivity to it, but oh, you go through this in an objective fashion as much you can. And and somebody like Bill Barnwell can come to the, the ranking of 24 and the Bills still have one of the most dangerous offenses in the league year in and year out, which is what Brandon Bean, frankly, is banking on by trading Stephon Diggs, that they can mm -hmm. uh, have some interchangeable parts. Uh, you're, you've talked about it. I know you did, you did a podcast uh, episode on it, uh, Stefan Diggs trade, but as time's gone on here, uh, how have some distance since the trade, the bills come away with Keon Coleman? How does, how does it sit with you now here as we're on the verge of training camp, the Diggs uh, not being on this team sub addition by subtraction or however you feel about it? Yeah, I, I, I like it more for the bills with each passing little bit of news I get about it. Um, it makes less and less sense for the Texans the more I think about it. I understand, okay, you're going to get a, a obviously impressive wide receiver um, in the prime or kind of coming out of the prime of his career maybe uh, for your young quarterback on a rookie deal. I think Bills did it with Stefan Diggs the first time around. They traded for a star receiver. They tried to trade for Antonio Brown. Um, they wanted to get a piece of Josh Allen early in his career. It made sense. No issue with that and understand the logic in wanting to move on from him now. Um what I would say is a couple things. I mean, the fact that the Bills or the, fact that the Texans basically voided the rest of Stefan Diggs's contract after this season, it tells you what you need to know about Stefan Diggs, right? Like he, even though he had just signed a new deal, clearly he wanted to get that one final, you know, bite of the apple before he retires or before he, he no longer is a significant NFL wide receiver. I don't fault him for that, but I don't think the Bills could credibly give him a new contract with like three or four years left on his prior deal. Um, I think that leads you to some conclusions about how you feel about Stefan Diggs. Um, in terms of the on-field play, you know, there has been so much written about it this offseason. Um, in terms of why he fell off in the second half, I don't think there's any one clear answer. I don't think it's one thing. I think it was probably a combination of the OC change, how teams were defending him. Um, how he was used a little more at the line of scrimmage on screens and stuff with Joe Brady versus uh, with Ken Dorsey. But ESPN has a number. And this will get Bills fans happy after they hated me for ranking the Bills 24th. ESPN has a metric. Um, they have receiver tracking metrics, one of which is open score, which tracks how well you are, how good you are at getting open. Um, very simply on a second by second basis, whether you're throwing the ball or not, based on the NFL's tracking data, where, where you were, how good you are at getting yourself open. And for the last several years, Stephon Diggs has been great at getting himself open. He's been in the top five, top five, I think in the top 10, each of the prior four seasons before last year. He was 67 this past year in Buffalo. I mean, the, the, the data suggested, doesn't mean it's guaranteed, the data suggested he had fallen off significantly um, at that point of his career. I'm not... I'm not qualified. I don't feel confident enough in my receiver judging ability based on watching tape to say I feel the same way. But I, I believe if the Bills still thought Stefan Diggs was a top five receiver, a top 10 receiver, even given what was going on behind closed doors, even given that he'd been frustrating, they would have found a way to make this work. They would have floated him some money that hadn't been guaranteed into a guarantee. They would have found a way to find this to, to make sense. I don't think you make this trade unless you feel like he's faded from being that guy and if the data says as much and brandon bean seems to think as much well maybe the bills won't miss stefan Diggs as much as maybe um you know the majority of people are making it out to be right now from your analytic perspective i know i keep leaning on that too heavily <laughs> and i i don't want to uh, let anybody think that you you don't uh you're some one trick pony uh, <laughs> i'm a no i'm a no trick pony actually <laughs> not even an analytic person uh, what about culture? What about the frustrations behind the scenes, as you mentioned? How do you factor that into the the calculus, or can you? Is that something that you just have to have some certain kind of self awareness, or uh, not oh, self awareness, but just uh, as a as a manager, you just have to be able to read the read the room or read read <laughs> things and kind of guess a little bit? Or the the idea again, it's addition by subtraction. It is a math phrase, <laughs> but you can't really quantify it. 
until it it happens. So I, I guess where do you where do you put that aspect of you know and, and Bills Sean McDermott and De- teammates have made comments not specific to Diggs but saying about how they feel a little easier now. It's not as <laughs> stressful around here. Uh, you know, guys guys heads are in the right places. You know, you hear these phrases coupled with. Nobody saying goodbye to Stefan Diggs at the trade. You didn't see a flood of Bill's <laughs> teammates saying, Hey man, we're going to miss you. Right. Um, there seems to be a, 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 a relief. Uh, anyways, there's a question yeah, yeah. baked in there somewhere, Bill. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but feel free to try to answer something. Yeah. I mean, it matters, right? Like, like realistically, you know, how, how you play, how you, how you perform is something, how you practice is something, what your life behind the scenes is something. I think being a pain, NFL teams are willing to tolerate if you play at a high level. And I think even something as simple as, was it in the Super Bowl last year? Was it in the conference championship game? When did Travis Kelsey shove Andy Reid? That was the soup in the Super Bowl. That was that was things, in the Super things Bowl, were right. going poorly and people yes. were saying. And I saw quite a bit of it. Stefan Diggs was still a member of the Bills, and it was getting a little kind of heated yeah. among fans and people yeah. being upset with me because some of the things that I'd written that I interviewed Devin McCourty during the season heading into that Dolphins game in the regular season finale in which Devin McCourty said in watching the film and preparing and also mm-hmm. with his knowledge of defensive back play and having right. needed to game plan for Stefan Diggs as an active player. His take was he thought that the Bills were trying to prove they don't need Stephon Diggs by purposely not feeding him the ball. They were going to everybody right. else. And, uh, uh, oh, shoot, I'm drawing, the, I'm drawing a blank. The uh, Trent Sherfield was playing yeah. more snaps than Stephon Diggs <laughs> a, a couple weeks in a row down the stretch. Um, yeah. Anyways, the – Travis Kelsey shoves Andy Reid, and immediately Bills fans on Twitter, imagine if that was Stephon right. Diggs. right. And I said, yeah, imagine if that was, if the, if the chiefs don't win that game, people are jumping Travis Kelsey's shit. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. when they win the game, nobody cares anymore. That was, you know, that's a, that's a pimple on Andy Reid's butt. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you win. Right. Sorry. Right. It it, it is a, it it is a fun story for Taylor Swift fans to tell about Travis Kelsey. Remember when he shoved Andy Reid and then they won anyway. And that, and I think, I think that's the balance, right? Like I think teams are willing across all sports, football being no exception, they're willing to tolerate behavior if you're producing and or if you are winning. And once that's not the case, that changes. I think with the Bills, of course, they did win late in the season. They went on the winning streak and and won the AFC East, but it does go back to training camp, right? I mean, there was the day Stefan Diggs stormed out of training camp and you know, I don't know if that was the beginning of the end. I don't know if the losing streak or the the, the, the rough stretch of losses in midseason kind of soured people on digs before they got to the end of the year. But I, I would say, I would hope that the most died in the wool hardcore analytics person would agree that that culture matters, that, that, that being excited to get to the building matters. I also, at the same time, though, I've never heard a bad team say, well, we suck. But at least everyone likes coming to the building every day. Like if you if you're bad, no one likes coming to the facility anyway. So, right. like like anything, I, I think at its worst, we treat it as a binary thing. Like you know, like Stefan Diggs is either the greatest human being who's ever human being, or he's a he's toxic and and he, having him in the Bills building prevents them from winning. It, it's it's a sliding scale. It's a balance of what are you offering? How are we doing? You know, what is it like to be around you every day? And then at some point, what are we paying you? Because I think clearly the Bills saw Stefan Diggs as someone who was very expensive. They wanted to make some changes. They had to deal with the reality of, you know, moving on from some guys for cap reasons. They had to deal with the reality of, you know, sort of retooling this roster. And after that was going to be done, as they were going to get younger, does it make sense if you have young guys in the locker room to have a guy who maybe is more vocal about what he wants than what the team wants. I think that's a, you know, when you're trading for that guy as the Texans, when you feel like you already have an established strong culture with guys who have been there and who are going to continue to be there, maybe that's different versus the Bills where you feel like, okay, yes, Josh is sticking around. Um, You know, some of the core players are sticking around, but 
they are making changes. A lot of the guys who have been there the past few years are gone, as you know. And the the voices in that locker room, some of them are gone, some of them are changed, some of them have different roles. Like that is a that is going to be a different room now than it was a year ago, even when you don't consider Stefan Diggs. And that's what happens with great teams. And I'm using yeah. the Chiefs and the Patriots as an example, not because I'm comparing the Bills, who have not been to the Super Bowl since 1993, but I'm comparing because it's the obvious example that you can give that people understand. When you have your great quarterback, the orbit is constant around it because of the money, the massive amount of money that needs to be dedicated to that great quarterback that you need to be able to figure out your – the the guys you can't, you can live without, even though they, they're the good players you can live without because it just becomes cost prohibitive. Yeah, look at every kill. I mean, the chiefs are the, are the perfect example of this. It doesn't even have to be an abstract conversation. Maybe that would have had to be in the past. The chiefs had Tyree kill. They trade Tyree kill. Tyree kill is fantastic for the dolphins better with the dolphins than he was with the chiefs. And the chiefs still went to super bowls because the pieces they got from that trade, Trent McDuffie being the biggest one, were valuable players on very small deals. They were able to spend money elsewhere to supplement parts of their roster. Like there is, there is an element in all sports. I think football as well of like when you're close to a Super Bowl, you have to go all in and keep the team together. You know, mortgage your future, and sometimes that works. The Rams did it, and it worked for the Rams. They won a Super Bowl. But I think the Patriots in the big picture, they were going to keep Brady until they didn't keep Brady at the very end, but. You know, they had a couple of core guys and they were very aggressive moving on from people thinking, you know, the, it's better for us to be young, to spread our money around, to not have a lot of players on huge deals, to try and have more depth as the year goes along. And I think Bill's fans, having seen, you know, how banged up the secondary was, the year they lost to the Bengals is a good example. Um, you know, that is a team that didn't have as much depth as the ones earlier in the Allen era when Allen was still on a rookie deal. And that's, that's a roster building philosophy and and the bills they went in the other direction right they made that all-in move they signed von miller gave him three guaranteed years very clearly that did not work out they couldn't have anticipated that miller would tear his acl but the reality is they tried it didn't work i think they had to go in a different direction and the chiefs are probably the best example of how well that can go even if you trade a guy who is a star elsewhere how do you feel about the bills defense uh, you know, here there's there's two elements of play, right? I mean, they've been consistently very good the past couple of years, even as they've lost Matt Milano to injury, Tredavious White to injury, as Kilier Kill Elon hasn't been 100%. They've lost Micah Hyde and Jordan Poirier to injuries at different points. They lost Jermaine Evans to the Bears altogether. And and Von Miller has been hurt and, and mediocre last year. What that tells me is that that, that coach they got there, right? pretty good at coaching defense to my knowledge I, I i think you know especially nationally sean mcdermott gets a lot of was getting a lot of criticism last year i i can certainly speak to my friends from the buffalo area the western new york area who were not thrilled with him this time last year and or in the mid-season of last year he's a really good coach and the bills have brought through a lot of young defensive players kind of in the first generation and in the in the you know with, with the milano draft and the tradavius white draft now more with you know Rousseau and Epinesa um, having a good year last year. Um, you know someone like Carol Dodson stepping up and playing well when Milano got hurt. You know they they have been bringing guys through. They're not perfect, but bringing guys through now for almost a decade. Uh, McCarver's been there what seven years now? Eight. I think this will be eight. his eighth season. So I mean you know 20, 2017, right? Yeah. Yeah. Twenty seven. So. Yeah. This is eight. Um, it, it tells you to me when you can do that across multiple generations, NFL wise, of talent in terms of like, you know, you build a whole defense, a bunch of guys, go, a bunch of those guys have to leave where they get injured or they're not 100%. You bring in other guys or you sign veterans who come to Buffalo and play better than they did elsewhere. Someone like, uh, like Poyer or Hyde, where they were better in Buffalo than they were elsewhere. Or someone like um, Jordan Phillips, right? The defensive tackle who had a career year in Buffalo left, came back, and was better than he had been when he went to go play for Arizona. That's coaching. And to me, that's why I'm optimistic about this defense. It's not just getting Milano back, but you have a coach to me who does a consistently very good job of developing a defensive talent. Not perfect, not 100%, but nobody is. And, and that is a really valuable 
thing to have because you can move on from guys. You can let guys go. You can draft and trust that in the big picture, you're going to develop those guys into starters. No different than what Belichick did in New England for a long time. No different than what Andy Reid does on the offensive side of the ball for the Chiefs. I think that is a a real competitive advantage, and I'm I see them as a top ten defense this year because of that. I wish I could, or somebody would offer. Uh, I'd like to know what the odds are. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they're very long, or no, short. They're short. <laughs> uh, take the field. Every time I see Sean McDermott on a list, uh, a betting list of who will be the next coach fired, <laughs> like he's not getting fired. I know to the dismay of a lot of fans, just because the fans are upset. You know, Terry Pagula loves him. Brandon Bean loves him. Sean you McDermott's sure? not going anywhere. That, that, that's it's funny because I, I I have to follow every team. So I'm I'm reading the beat writers from every team. I am, you know, I, I hear from fans from every team. And there are two coaches where fans complain about them. And I just say, you don't know how good you have it. Or you've forgotten how good you have it. And that's Sean McDermott and Mike Tomlin. Where if either of those guys left, the chances that the, guy, the next guy would be significantly worse are 95, 98%. And the other guy who I thought that about years and years ago was Andy Reid in Philadelphia. Because Eagles fans, they'll pretend they didn't say it now. They hated Andy Reid for years. It was, oh, he's never going to, he can't win a Super Bowl. He's outdated. Right. He's never going to get over the cusp. And Andy Reid went to Kansas City. He got a quarterback. He was pretty good. He won three Super Bowls. Suddenly figured it out. And with McDermott, I mean, those fans have gone through coaches who were not that great. They've gone through that experience. And I think rightfully expectations are higher than they were a decade ago because of what Sean McDermott has done. But you'd have to hire, you'd have to have a really good coach in the bag for me to say, okay, I think the Bills should fire Sean McDermott because the next guy is going to give them a better chance of winning a Super Bowl. I There's just not many coaches on the planet. I can say that and feel confident about. I mean, Adam Gase, Chip Kelly, Cliff Kingsbury. I mean, the idea of the coach, like people, yeah. everybody's got an idea who they think the next great coach is going to be, and it's usually mm -hmm. wrong. It is. And we we suck. We are terrible as a society at figuring out who's going to be a good coach. Even after they've been an NFL coach, Adam Gase was a coach of the year candidate for his first year in Miami. He won, I think they won 10 games, went to the postseason. Adam Gase was like a, oh man, why didn't we hire that guy kind of hire? Right. And then he was probably the worst coach in football is now out of the sport altogether. It is a, when you go back, if, if you want to as a fan, realize how lucky you are, go look at the initial reports for who your team is going to interview when you fire your coach and hire a new coach. Because there'll be about seven or eight people. Usually, if you look back a few years later, it's a couple of guys who became NFL head coaches, one of whom is good, one of whom is terrible, a couple of coordinators who were kind of on the cusp, maybe they're college coaches, and then four guys who were out of football because for a brief moment, they looked like they were a hot head coaching candidate and it turned out they were not even a good positional coach or a good coordinator. It is a, it is a process where there is very little logic behind it. There is, it's, it's strictly a vibes-based process or a who-do-you-know-based process and it is hard to find a good one. And Sean McDermott, the overwhelming evidence is that he is a very, very good NFL head coach. Well, let's wrap this up, Bill, with uh, by coming full circle and talking uh, some AFC East. I yeah. mean, you don't have to get uh, you know, into too much detail, but how do you see – I still see the Bills as the best team in the AFC East. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's the cynic in me and the fact that I've just seen the Jets do it to themselves so many times, <laughs> and Aaron Rodgers just never seems to disappoint when it comes to some sort of silliness. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Miami's lost some important players, especially on defense, and the Patriots are in a clear rebuild. How do you see the division? I think it's very close. I think it's, I think honestly, I, I, I will say, I think the Patriots are better than people think. I know that they're in a clear rebuild, but I think if you look at the numbers, they were the best defense in football over the second half of 2023. And that was without Matt Judon, their best pass rusher, without Christian Gonzalez, their first round pick and best cornerback with the worst field position in football from a terrible offense with nothing to play for and a lame duck coach. And yes, Bill Belichick's gone. And maybe Gerard Mayo won't be Bill Belichick in terms of his defensive coaching. But 
I think that defense is really good, and they're really going to give people problems. And if Drake May is any good as a, as a quarterback, that's a major upgrade as well. So to me, I think I don't think they're going to win the division. I don't think they're the, the Texans this year, but I think people are writing them off as a four or five win team, and I think they're probably a seven or eight win team. And that changes kind of how high this division can get because the other teams are good. Um, to me, I think the Dolphins have taken a step backwards. They lost a ton in free agency. They're starting over with their offensive line in a lot of ways. Um, their best player is Tyree Kill, who's in his 30s now. I know he's been incredibly productive. It's hard for me to imagine him being better this year than he was last year. Um, they have injuries to key players up front. To me, I think they're the third best team in this division. I, I, I think it's Bills and Jets at the top, but I think it comes down to how healthy the Jets are. If you can promise me 17 games of Aaron Rodgers, of Tyron Smith, of Mike Williams, um, I would say the Jets are the better team, but you can't promise me that. And I think that's the the big concern for me. Um, so I, I think I would say Bills at like 11, 10 and 7, 11 and 6. Dolphins maybe, uh, oh, sorry, Jets in the 9 and 8, 10 and 7 range. Maybe that's a 10 and 7 for the Jets. Maybe Dolphins below them in the 8 and 9 win range and the Patriots below them at 7, 7 and 8 wins. So closer than I think people think, but I still think the Bills are probably right there with the Jets for the best team in the division. I want to commend you on your 17 game math because I still <laughs> do 16 games when I'm thinking about seasons. Everything's oh, in a 16 game, you know. Uh, Speaking get, of analytics, I, all, all my spreadsheets got messed up. I'm like, I, I was from like building data and I'm like, why does this not add up? What's wrong? Oh, right. Everything's got to be a so, game average, right? Instead yeah, of seasons. In, infuriating. Well, that, that was the, I, like, like I, I wanted for player's sake to only play 16 games to keep them healthy. Also for my sake, in terms of not having to update all my data, I wanted to stick with 16 games, but nobody listened to me. The numbers are all out of whack. Thousand yard seasons don't mean the same. Yes. Playoffs. We, we, now getting to the playoffs as the seven seed like means so much less to me when, when people are talking about, Oh, we made the, like the giants a couple of years ago, the giants made the playoffs. Okay. Like that's, there's nearly half the conference makes it like your team isn't good just because you made the playoffs. You can be good if you make the playoffs, but it's not like, it doesn't mean as much as it used to, unfortunately. Bill, thank you for this. I've of enjoyed course. it immensely. And I know that, uh, here it is on the weekend. It's a summer right before we're about to ramp up. You're supposed to be chilling, catching your breath. So am I for that matter, but here we are talking ball. <laughs> well, we could be at, at a Buffalo Bisons game, uh, checking out Joey Votto, but we're men of football. If I'd have known, I probably would have actually, well, I still could make it. The game doesn't start for another an hour and 15 minutes. He is one of my all-time favorite players. He's a great player. Great player, obviously. a And a great dude. Ontario. If you're reading about him, yeah, he's yeah. a Canadian. And, uh, but he's, he's just a character. He's just a, you know, a love of the game kind of guy. He's just right in my wheelhouse as a great yes. baseball dude. Yes. And I mean, the fact that he's playing for the, you know, he's playing in triple A as a future hall of famer could very easily have retired. Uh, it, it takes a certain level of humility as you're trying to ramp up to play in triple A and try to get back. So I applaud him for that as well. Bill, thank you. And Thanks to everybody out there for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs of Business Consultants. By the way, Bill, mm -hmm. did you know? No, you didn't know. How could you know? My co-host Jonah Bronstein doesn't even know. CTBK is picking us up for another season, so we're happy about that. Wow. Our relationship uh, continues uh, into our uh, seventh year, eighth year. Wow. The McDermott era. Does it go back to Rex Ryan? It might. When we were on terrestrial radio, you remember terrestrial radio, Bill? <laughs> I do, back in the day. All right. Uh, go enjoy your weekend. And uh, thanks to everybody out there for listening. Uh, subscribe, like, do all the things. And uh, we'll catch you next week when Bill's open training camp here on Tim Graham and Friends. CTBK gives executives and owners of mid-market businesses unparalleled confidence and clarity so you can focus on strategic objectives and organizational success. Their multidisciplinary advisors, accountants, and team members have a wealth of experience and are all available and responsive to each client to ensure the most effective advice, actions, and outcomes, no matter the situation or complexity level. 
That experience base and one team approach combined with integrated and efficient way of operating enable them to be truly proactive partners doing the best thing for their client every time. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK can work for you. We'll